Folk, I'm going to do like we do with the newspapers and start at the end instead of at the beginning. But I thought about this over the weekend. The end is simply why did what happened actually happen? In other words, why did the British lose? All right. One reason the British lost was the French helped. Another reason was the British did not use their loyalists. Now, loyalists were persons who were loyal to Great Britain. The British did not trust them, but about probably as many as a third of the colonials did not side with the rebellious colonies. And if the British would have used them, they'd probably have easily won. Instead, they would hardly enlist them. The British would not, army would not forage for food. I mean, armies had down through the ages have stolen food from their enemies. The British somehow felt like this was beneath them, so they waited on supplies of food from England, which took four months to get there. So they had an uncertainty of food supplies. The royal governors fled. But I want to add a few things to that. The Spanish, when Spain went to war with Britain, there's a saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Now, Spain would not fight on the side of the colonies because Spain feared if the colonies won, they'd set their sights on Florida and New Mexico and Texas, which, as you may know, the United States eventually did. The United States eventually got Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, all from Spain. But nevertheless, Spain going toward Britain helped the colonies out. Now, your book might not mention this, but some of the books have. Russia and Holland also threatened war with Britain, and Britain said, we can't handle Spain and France and the colonies, and Russia, and Holland. We just can't handle it all. Great Britain got deeper and deeper in debt. But something else I want to add in there, too. The British looked on war as being seasonal. And twice, the colonials surprised them. George Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas Eve and captured a 1,000 hired British Hessians. They were Germans that the King of England had hired against them. But they looked on war as seasonal. And then George Rogers Clark went in the dead of winter and captured forts in Indiana and what is today Indiana and Illinois and Ohio and uh, surprised the British because the British had no idea that any kind of colonial armor was nearby. And also, Great Britain is a small country. The British did not realize the distances involved, sheer large distances. All these things help. Now, there's something else, too. When the royal governors fled, civil power returned to colonies. Well, the British had a problem. If they kept their army all together, the colonies could operate wherever the British army was not located. But when the British decided to scatter their armies out, the colonials defeated them piecemeal, which we're going to talk about before the period's over. Clinton, General Clinton and General Cornwallis split up, and Cornwallis went south, and Clinton stayed in New York, and the Colonials defeated Cornwallis, and uh, Clinton did not have enough men left to fight with. So uh, wherever the uh, British were not, the Colonials could be, and uh, all this contributed greatly to the British losing the war. Otherwise, the war should have been an easy war for Great Britain. Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams, who was our second president, wanted to know if the revolution would give, would give more rights for women. Her husband did not agree with that. John Adams, I mean, we'd have the letters that John Adams wrote to his wife. John Adams spent most of his time down in Philadelphia, or when the British took Philadelphia, he had to flee farther south while his wife lived up in Massachusetts. But they wrote letters back and forth, and uh, he, John Adams said, I've noticed that Indians, blacks, and even children are acting more independent of authority. Reminds me of something Socrates said. Socrates said, even the animals don't obey their masters anymore, and he blamed it on democracy. But uh, 
And he said that eventually what happens, so he saw that according to Socrates now, when people get tired of having too much liberty, they'll eventually demand someone, some strong man come in and take over. But what do I mean by people getting tired of too much liberty? When punk kids will tear up your flower garden and knock over your mailboxes and break out your windshield and things like that. And uh, people commit crimes to get away with them. People begin to demand that someone come in and take over who's strong and who brings some kind of law and order. Uh, so far, this has not happened in our country yet. But many a democracy has failed when a strong man has taken over. All right, now, to the war itself. Um, after the battles of Lexington and Concord, the Congress had to do two things that are contradictory. Number one is raise an army to fight, and number two, try to reconcile. Well, as hopes for reconciliation failed, the colonists, or the de delegates, had to consider declaring that they were now independent of Great Britain. Well, they set up the Second Continental Congress. It had no legal authority to act. It had not been sanctioned by Great Britain. But the colonies were fast being ruled by committees that were being set up. Royal governors took off running, set sail for England. Royal governors were governors whom the king had appointed. Um, ben Franklin, he had been close friends with George III. I mean, there's a saying that opposite ends of tract. Ben Franklin grew up in poverty. Of course, you know, George III grew up in a palace. He was heir apparent from the day he was born. And they remained friends, but eventually they had a falling out. And Ben Franklin was sent back to Philadelphia. And there at Philadelphia, Ben Franklin was then assigned a the job of going to France and negotiating with the French. It has been said that when Great Britain kicked Ben Franklin out of London, that right there the British lost the war. Because Ben Franklin was a skillful diplomat who was able to persuade the King of France to uh, to fight on the side of the colonies. Well, a lot of colonial people still wanted reconciliation. And uh, some colonial people said that if we, we have to fear France and Spain and the Indians, we still need Great Britain's protection. But on June 14, 1775, the Continental Congress um, decided to raise an army. They chose chose George Washington to lead that army. And uh, a message was sent to Great Britain that, hey, this is no local uprising, but all 13 colonies are united now in there. They're fighting against you. Thomas Jefferson wrote, a, wrote the document, but the, the Congress came in and toned down much of what he said, much of Jefferson's disappointment. The Congress also issued paper money, which they hoped to finance the war. And this became a problem because the um, Congress had no gold to back up its paper money. Now, you may know, or maybe, maybe you don't know, at one time, paper money to have any value had to have gold backed up, and we keep our gold at Fort Knox. Today, our money, our paper money is just that, paper. If we don't have a gold standard anymore. President Richard Nixon was to take us off the gold standard. But that's jumping around in the story a little bit. All right. General Gage was a British general. He received reinforcements. He was ordered to root out the rebels around Boston. So the Americans took control of Breed's Hill. The battle has always been called the Battle of Bunker Hill, which was located next to Breed's Hill, but it was actually fought on Breed's Hill. The British attacked the Americans. The colonials held their fire until, honest, until they could see the whites of the British soldiers' eyes. Then they opened a volley, and a volley means they all fired at once. They reloaded and all fired again. The British retreated. The British charged up a second time. Again, the colonials fired, and the British retreated. But then, when the British charged a third time, the colonials ran out of ammunition, and the colonials were forced to retreat. The Battle of Bunker Hill, though, is a moral victory for the colonials. George Washington was not there yet, but he rejoiced at the outcome. He said, it's proven that we can stand up to a trained British army and fight. We just need more ammunition. So when George Washington arrived, he found 
his army without ammunition. This is not in a book, that's why I have it in italics. Ethan Allen captured Fort Ticonderoga and they uh, captured a lot of cannon and ammunition. This ammunition, this cannon was put on the ridges looking down on Boston. Boston's back in a valley surrounded by hills on all sides except the one side where the port, the water is. Anyway, the cannon was uh, shooting down on Boston and at that point the British and their loyalists fled. Mostly the, the civilians, the women and children, fled to Canada. A lot of their descendants are still there. General Gage was replaced by General Howe, whom the British thought to be a stronger general. Washington arrived and he saw a severe lack of discipline. He saw a case where an officer was setting up a barber shop and shaving some of the enlisted men. He said, now wait a minute, folks, this, this doesn't go, this is not an army. He uh, began to uh, try to uh, train them, discipline them, get some kind of order. It was difficult. Um, Thomas Paine wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense. Among other things, he said that just because a man was born the son of a king, does that make him qualified? What if he's not smart enough to be king? A reference to George III. That, a, oh, that the only time a leader should therefore be appointed based on his known abilities and not appointed because he's the son of a king. Well, um, anyway, we'll have more to say about Thomas Paine a little bit later. Thomas Paine had come from Great Britain. He started off as a Methodist minister, came to Britain. They came to the colonies of Britain and then took the side of the colonies and joined Washington's army as a writer. Well, time went on. On July 2nd, 1776, Congress passed a resolution calling for independence. The document was formally adopted on July 4th. Now, folk, I want you all to know, if you don't learn anything else, why do Americans, now those of you who aren't Americans might not know, but hopefully you'll know now, why do Americans celebrate the 4th of July? It's because the Declaration of Independence has that date on it. And if you actually look at the Declaration, it says in big bold print top, in Congress, July 4th, 1776. And then uh, when in the course of human events, we had to memorize the preamble. Basically, it says, starts off saying, when one nation decides to break from another, it should tell the world why it's, why it's doing so. And then, folk, if you read it, it has a style that I don't want to see from any of you. Every sentence is a one-sentence paragraph, which is a no-no for the most part in today's writing. But they all begin the same way. He has, he has, he has, he has, he has, he has, over and over and over again. He, the he was George III. He has sent our own legislatures home. He has imposed governors on us with our consent. He has forced us to pay the wages of the governors from our coffers. He has taken our people abroad to be tried for crimes committed and uh, to be tried in England without a jury. He has this. Now, weirdly enough, what we are taught, have been taught for more than 200 years, I guess, is that taxation was a real issue. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, taxation is like number 19 for imposing taxes on us without our consent. Not very high up, to say the least. Now, conspicuous, if you actually, when this campus used to have a copy of the document, if they still do, I don't know where it's located. If any of you know where it is, I'd appreciate knowing. But they used to have a copy of it right here on the campus. John Hancock wrote with very large letters. He had heard a rumor that the King of England had bad eyesight. He said, I'm going to make sure the King doesn't need his spectacles to read this. So he wrote it in big, bold letters. Several other people. Now, George Washington did not sign it. He was up fighting the, around Boston. But uh, Thomas Jefferson signed it. Ben Franklin signed it. Charles Carroll of Carrollton signed it. Robert Morris. Two of Robert E. Lee's uh, relatives signed it. Two names. You'll find on it uh, that uh, bear the last name of Lee, 
Um, John Adams signed it. Several prominent Americans signed it, sent it to the king, essentially declaring, we are now an independent country. All right. The war was never declared, but there was a war officially on. Both sides had reasons to believe that uh, the war would, winning the war would be difficult. For one thing, the colonies were taking on the most powerful army and most powerful navy in the world. Now, if you study genealogy like I do, soldiers who enlisted were promised two things, a bonus that would take place years later, and land. Now later, in 1826 or so, there was an economic downturn, 1819, an economic downturn, and the Congress decided to go ahead and pay these soldiers the bonus they promised them, and it helped pull the economy back up because it put money into the economy, which the colonial, former colonial army spent. As for land, some of my own ancestors who fought in the army received land in western Pennsylvania, and that's why I have roots in western Pennsylvania because some of my ancestors received land and there was no land to give them east of the Appalachians, so what Congress did to fulfill the promise gave them land west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, the colonial army never had very much, I mean, it's a strong discipline, but it wasn't as bad as was estimated. Now, at one time or another, the British got hold of every port in America, but the problem was the ports were so widely scattered, the British simply could not hold all the ports. If they held the port of New York, the Colonials would operate in Charleston. When the British went to Charleston, the Colonials would go to Philadelphia. When the British got control of Philadelphia, the Colonials went back up to Boston. So the British simply did not have enough of an army to hold all of these seaports. Keep in mind, the colonies were big. All right. They decided that they would first divide the colonies, and the first place they would get was New York. Let's see. And sp yeah, split the colonies in two. Oops. Now, uh, I know you might say, well, New York is not exactly in the middle, but keep in mind Georgia here was not as populated as the others, so New York was almost in the middle of the populated part of the colonies. But they decided to go and take New York. George Washington was not able to stop General Howe. General Howe got New York City, and George Washington almost lost the war. But a big, dense fog came up, just as Washington was about to be clobbered, and the fog separated the British from the colonials, and Washington was able to use the fog as a cover while his men got across Long Island and into the mainland and also George Washington ordered all the boats be removed from uh, this area on Long Island so where the British when their fog lifted they had no boats. General Howe didn't worry about that he said oh, I'll get Washington later. All right. um, The Continental Army did go up to Montreal. Now, folk, we never got Canada. The nearest thing we got was Montreal, but then in time to take Quebec, we failed. Ultimately, the Canadians remained independent. We tried again in the War of 1812 to take Canada. The British Army put us both times. So Canada remained independent of us. Um, Yeah, I've already mentioned this. Several battles were fought, and during these battles, Howe chased Washington all the way to Philadelphia. Well, Howe then decided it was winter time. He rested his troops instead of going after the defeated Washington. Thinking Washington would rest, Howe celebrated Christmas. Washington instead crossed the Delaware River and captured more than a thousand German mercenaries or Hessians. And when the Colonials found out that the king was hiring troops to fight against them. The king's popularity dropped way down. Washington continued to surprise the British before he finally settled down for the winter himself. 
Keep in mind, in those days, it's believed winters were colder than they are now. This was still during the... Well, the Little Ice Age had ended, and it was, things were starting to warm up. But they weren't as warm as they were going to get. So winters in those days were cold. 20 to 30 percent of the colonial population were loyal. Another 20 to 40 percent were neutral. So George Washington had to depend on approximately a third of the colonials. Because, again, up to 40 percent would not take sides and up to 30 percent were still loyal to Great Britain. The wealthy people tended to be loyalists and this really hurt the cause of the uh, colonies. A lot of Indian tribes sided with the colonists at first, but by the end of the, by the, end of the war most of them were for the British. Somehow we lost the loyalty of the Indians. Uh, we go into speculation who was a traitor. Sometimes a kid would have a father who was loyal to the king and a mother who was loyal to the colonies or vice versa. A lot of families lost property. Now, I worked at Lockheed with a woman whose ancestor was living in Charleston. He said to the colonies, you're just not ready to get independent yet. You don't have enough economy. They took everything he had away from him and he lost all of his property and never gained it back. A lot of loyalists were tarred and feathered, and a lot of them were sent to Canada. A lot of them fled to Canada. And a lot of them fled to England. Um, Congress resorted to borrowing to try to get money. They issued bonds. This was the beginning of the American government's issuing savings bonds. And uh, we'll hear more about these bonds later because when the war was over and the war had been won, Alexander Hamilton had to decide how we're going to pay that back this debt that we owe and he managed to uh, make arrangements to pay it back. But uh, that, that'll come later. <clears throat> now, Um, the British got together at the end of 1776 and they decided, well now that we've got New York, let's get Albany along the Hudson River and then we'll control the entire Hudson and we'll have divided the colonies in two and we won't let any colonial ships in go from, or any colonial people go from one part of the colonies to another. So they aimed at Albany. St. Ledger was to come down from Canada. Burgoyne was to come from the West, and Howe was to come from New York. Yeah, you'd think Albany's going to get it. Now, how many of you know, how many British troops actually arrived in Albany? Does anybody know? I'll tell you, not one. You'd think Albany, but see, the big mistake was made by Howe. Anyway, St. Ledger came down here. He found his men getting sick from mosquitoes being shot at from... Uh, Colonial snipers, the snipers shoot and then disappear, shoot and disappear, and finally he gave up and he turned back. General Howe, now he made the biggest mistake of all. General Howe decided, ah, I'm not going to go to Albany, I'll go to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is more important, so again, keep in mind, they had no radios, no telephones. Howe went to Philadelphia. So, that was the biggest part of the British Army, he did not even go to Albany. As for Burgoyne, now this is a very important. Burgoyne kept getting sniped at and sniped at. Then finally he met an army at Saratoga. Initially he won, but then the fighting resumed several days later, and this time, the, for the first time, a British army was swept to its knees and forced to surrender. They wrote a book some hundred years ago entitled Ten most decisive battles in world history. The Battle of Saratoga goes down as one of them. Thanks to the Battle of Saratoga, Ben Franklin was able to persuade the King of France that, hey, the colonies can fight. They can whip the British. And the King of France decided to assist the colonies, King Louis XVI. But uh, again, now, the battle occurred in 1777. The French help did not arrive until 1781, four years later, but it did arrive. Anyway, Albany, not one British soldier got there. As for Washington, he kept fighting 
Uh, there was a battle of uh, Germantown, Battle of Brandywine Creek that we're about to name. My great, 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 great grandfather took part in both of those battles, the Battle of Germantown. Washington lost them all, by the way. Washington kept losing and losing, and finally he was forced out of Philadelphia. He went to a place in Pennsylvania, the winter called Valley Forge, where he spent a very, very terrible winter. Um, Brandywine Creek, yeah, big loss. The British proposed peace but not complete independence. The colonies refused. Again, Washington went to Valley Forge. Here's the sad part of the story. There was a lot of food there in Pennsylvania that could have fed Washington's army, but the farmers were not willing to take continental dollars. Uh, the farmers would only take British money, which the colonials didn't have. Washington's men bled, suffered, froze, got sick, and many of them died. Um, American officers could oftentimes not tell the difference between friendly and unfriendly Indians, and much too often <coughs> the Americans killed friendly Indians, influencing them to switch side of the British. Now, on a personal note, when I was a kid, I used to read stories about the Revolutionary War and how the Indians would oftentimes fight with the British, and the colonials found themselves fighting the British and the Indians. Um, Spain and France were reluctant to support a nation that was going against monarchy, but keep in mind, the French had lost the Seven Years' War, and um, they felt they owed England a debt. They basically they, they wanted to get even. So the French king finally agreed to uh, help the colonies. But initially, the French fleet went to the West Indies to uh, take care of defending French territory there. That's why, from the time the Battle of Saratoga was fought to the time help arrived, it was four years. The French spent about three years fighting in the uh, West Indies. Um, oh yeah, the founder of the American Navy, I mean this is a little bit of a side, but John Paul Jones by name was really, he wanted to be the first person to tell Ben Franklin that we'd won a battle of Saratoga. So he took off and sailed north and got in some really icy cold waters. I mean the battle occurred in October. He tried sailing a north route in December. He got to France Went to Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin said, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Jones, but a fast ship took a southerly route, a warmer route, and beat you here, and I learned the news this morning. Jones was really somewhat let down, but hey, I mean, I thought I'd be the first one to give Ben Franklin the news. No, Ben Franklin already heard the news hours ago. All right, so much for that. A lot of British people began to favor ending the war. George III would not end it, so the war went on. Now, um, eventually General Howe was criticized severely for not going up to Albany and he was blamed largely for the fact that the, the British did not get the Hudson River and instead so General Howe resigned and he was replaced with Clinton. Clinton was given a really strong army, so strong that Washington could not oppose it. So Washington got on one side of the Hudson River and Howe got on the other. And they spent about two or three years just watching each other from across the river while the war turned to the south. General Howe sent General Cornwallis here in the south. General Cornwallis won some really big battles at first. The Continental Congress, without consulting Washington, sent a man named General Lincoln, no relation to Abraham Lincoln, but sent General Lincoln. Lincoln was clobbered. Then they sent General Gates to Hewitt, Saratoga. General Gates met Howe, met, met, met Cornwallis in a battle, and even though General Gates had the better, bigger army, he got spooked and panicked and took off running. Any of you know anything about a military situation? When your top commanding officer takes off running pell-mell from the battlefield, guess what the men do? 
the men all fled, and there are two big victories. So finally, the Continental Congress asked George Washington, who should we pick? And Washington said, pick Nathaniel Green. They sent Nathaniel Green. Nathaniel Green did not have the, as big an army as Lincoln and uh, Gates had had, but he nevertheless got Howe to chase him.